Marcelo, pleasure. Pleasure to have you. Thank you for joining me on the podcast. Thanks for having you, Rene. Yeah, it's a lot pleasure. of fun. Yeah, definitely. And we're here at COP. We're literally standing in the green zone near the entrance of the blue zone. Um, pretty in, in, interesting time in the market. I think maybe we could start... Um, I'd love to get your views on, on the market, the kind of evolution, markets 2.0, etc. But can we, un, can we just rewind a little bit? I'd love to, for the audience to learn a little bit more about Viridios. You're the CEO of Viridios AI, but Viridios is a broader uh, company effectively with different verticals. Can you take us through just at, at a top co level, what are those verticals? And then specifically, let's dive down into the AI and the tech piece. Absolutely, Rene. So Viridius is a, is a group of today of three companies. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, everything started with a conversation in uh, Climate Week, New York, NYC, yep. in 2019. 2019, okay. When I met uh, Eddie Listorti in person. Eddie yep. is, uh, is a veteran in financial markets. He sure is. Uh, he's uh, he, he's the, uh, one of the co-founders together with Jeff Clear. Mm -hmm. And at that stage, has spent already three years uh, with a vision to start this company, this group of companies. We met, uh, we met in, in Climate, NYC, uh, Climate Week NYC in 2019, and from there, Veridius was born. So, and the idea was really uh, to have two groups of, uh, a group of two companies, one Veridius Capital, mm -hmm. which would uh, do offsetting, trading, origination, investment in projects, and so on. Yep. And Veridius AI, which is the company I'm running in the group, uh, which does the data and technology. Let's think of it as a Bloomberg uh, terminal for, for the carbon markets. Mm -hmm. More recently, uh, we acquired Pangolin, uh, which is a, a big brand, a big uh, consulting brand in, Very brand well known in Australia. Very well-known Very well-known. And uh, they're part of the family now, so fantastic. a group of three companies now. Great. Okay, cool. I mean, that, that's fantastic. So you've got effectively the consulting piece on the, and advisory on, on Pangolin side. You've got the capital markets piece, and then you've got the technology with Viridius AI. Can you, can you explain to me a little bit more about the underlying technology or, and, and the suite of offerings that, that you guys have on the Viridius AI side? Yeah, so as I mentioned, we, we aggregate all of the data of carbon projects mm -hmm. in the market. In fact, we started, the reason why Viridius AI, we have a lot of AI functionality, yep. but the reason why is uh, we, we named the company this way is because we started with the AI pricing. Right. For example, when we launched this product that we uh, back in 2021, mm -hmm. was an AI-based engine to price carbon credits across the market. There, at, at that stage, you, you may remember, there was very little pricing, very little uh, pricing. transparency in the market. Absolutely. That was kind of a revolutionary offering at that stage. Very much so. I remember and, at the time when you guys launched, it was definitely revolutionary. Yes. And then fast forward to now. So mm -hmm. as we went along you know, developing the product, there was a need for project-level pricing, analytics, data and so on. And that's what we have today. We cover in the VCM over 17,000 projects on 17, the screen. 17,000 projects? That's right. Wow. Uh, five registries, uh, uh -huh. ACR, CAR, CDM, Vera, VCS, and Gold Standard. Wow. With, uh, with pretty much the project details on a single template, we can actually compare projects across different standards. Mm -hmm. uh, on the project uh, details or uh, data level, we actually curate the data. We correct errors that may or may not be on the registry. Uh, directly uh, getting this data from the documentation and of course pricing at vintage level okay. right for each and every project that's on the platform okay right and we expand now into the Australian markets now we have IQ prices on the platform as well and and there are a whole pipeline of products that are about to come uh, in 2024 okay interesting so on, on you mentioned pricing many times so where are you determining those prices obviously you have a capital vertical and that's obviously providing some transactional flow but are you also plugged into other price reporting agencies or exchanges? Is that, is that a source of information for you with regards to pricing? In fact, or yeah. How do you do so? Yeah, no, good question. In fact, the source of pricing is actually from the market. From it's the market. not at all from, from the capital side. Okay. We have very strict firewalls, okay. uh, in which case we don't know what they do. We don't know what that side of business uh -huh. uh, is transacting at or things like that. And we collect data across the market from brokers, project developers, corporates. Oh, great. And, uh, Think of us as a, as a data aggregator like IHS market. Okay. So what they did for credit full swap curves, for example, they mm -hmm. collect market contributions across different names. We do the same for projects. And we normalize, we, we check for outliers, we, we do, there's a whole methodology to create the vintage curves for projects that are observed yes. in the market. And that's where we use a little bit of AI to extrapolate, to actually price, mm -hmm. proxy price projects that we never there was never even a, a transaction. market transaction oh, that's observable. But yeah, which but is why we have like over 16,000 projects with prices. With prices. On price, okay, on the and, and that's a dynamic environment. It's, it's constantly changing depending on, on a daily basis. basis. Okay, and so who are your type of clients that are subscribing to this data set? Because I think there's incredible value there. 
right? With, with such a wide coverage, essentially you mentioned you're competing effectively against IHS market, so Opus previously was there and now that's a Dow Jones, but now you've got uh, also S&P, right? Which is, which is now merged with IHS. So they've got a price reporting agency and, and a distribution network. It seems that you guys are comparable in that regard. Who, who are your type of clients? Yeah, so, and just to clarify, S&P is actually our partner. Oh, really? We actually pu publish indices, AI-based indices called okay. Carbex. Yep. Uh, since 2021 with okay. S&P. So the type of pricing that we publish is different from S&P because mm -hmm. we don't publish benchmark indices and things like that, unless if we are in partnership with them. Uh, we, we publish the project, project level. level prices, okay. which uh, is very important for now, the, the question of the industry. clients, mm -hmm. right? For example, think you are a bank, financial institution, when you book, you buy, you buy a certain common uh, credit from, from the market and you have to put that in your systems, in your risk systems, mm -hmm. in your books. Now you need to mark those prices, uh, those, those, those projects, mm. and do the daily market to market risk, IPV, independent price verification, product, product control, and so on. These are the types of, of clients, asset managers, banks, but we also have coppers, have project developers. So there, there are many use cases uh, across the whole platform for different types of segments in the market. Fantastic, so it's a really broad coverage and kind of diversified business model. Okay, great. And you mentioned AI being at the core genesis, and you mentioned obviously the distribution around different vintages and, and how that could help you glean some of that, that price information. But I remember also you guys were also looking at a, a more granular view as well at the impacts of SDGs as well and how they would be priced. Could, do you guys want to, do you want to talk about that as well? Absolutely. So. Uh, that, that was actually one of the vi uh, part of our vision when we started, right? Mm -hmm. This is this market is not only carbon, yeah, right? This way beyond carbon, co-benefits have real value, and in fact, in, on a voluntary basis, corporates are buying carbon credits because of the co-benefits in many many instances, mm -hmm. right? Not not only for the for the carbon component. So we started the platform with evaluation directly at the SDG level. In fact, we still have the AI based uh, simulation on the platform where you can price the single carbon component of the project, but you can actually simulate the pricing at the SDG level. If this really? project had 10 SDGs, and that the specific SDGs, what would have been the price? So we developed this through AI, mm -hmm. right? And the way we do that, we bootstrap or we extract that pricing information through training the models with thousands of data points sure. across different types of projects, Red Plus, cook stoves, and renewable mm -hmm. energy, and so on. But for that, there's another AI component, which is knowing what SDGs each project are actually contributing to. Of course. So yeah. use LLM language models, AI language models, to parse thousands of pages of project documentation and extract information or evidence of contributions of projects to SDGs. Okay. So you see there is the pricing side, yes. using AI components to value, and the identification of, of AI yeah. contributions from the projects using LLM models. Okay, so going into that, I mean, that's fantastic that you're, you're effectively your AI and now you can feed it that, those LLMs. But there's a glaring kind of issue for me, and uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm a layperson when it comes to, to the AI side, but what I do know is that the those inputs at the registry level, they're not necessarily standardized. They all have very different kind of mapping. So how, how, does, how do you train your models with such a diverse kind of offering that's not necessarily standardized? You have monitoring reports now that have SDG contributions. On the Vera side, Gold Standard has equivalents, but how, how, do you, how do you effectively glean that information and derive those, those outputs? Excellent question. It's actually more difficult than that because yeah. uh, some monitoring reports will actually nudge into, oh, this is an SDG number 10 or eight, whatever. Sure. Right? But a lot of them don't even say that. It just says, look, well, this project contributes to uh, the 100 jobs in the village, blah, 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 right? So the LLM model has to understand that that matches one of the SDG targets under a certain goal. Okay. And that's how we train the model. So we extract like thousands and thousands of sentences from these documents. And over the tagging, initially, there was an analyst tagging. Oh, this is SG8, this is SG10, and so on and so forth. And these days, the, the model understands what SGs they are. And, can and there is a third layer, but there is a third layer. There is always the analyst mm -hmm. uh, going and confirming whether those SGs are actually true or not. Right. A machine can still make mistakes. Sure, of course. That's why we still have to have the human element, the human element. in there yep. confirming that tagging of that SG. But that duality of the human and the machine, that provides much more leverage to what would have otherwise been a human-led task. Absolutely. Right? So now you're going to get a higher throughput of, of that data. So that's fantastic. 
now, I mean, you're touching on so many really interesting points that I'd love to kind of pivot if you'll allow me. So uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of conversation around cover markets 2.0. Right, and whether we look at it from now kind of backwards is carbon markets 1.0 and now looking forwards 2.0, great. It's a bit semantics. I, I think we're in carbon markets 3.0, but let's put that aside. But the market is evolving around digital monitoring, reporting, verification. And it would seem to me that a lot of the tools that you have developed for ingesting and then providing price inputs and then those quality inputs can also be applied at a, at a DMIV component. Can you, can, you communicate, like, can you talk about that essentially? Yeah, that, that's the that's the path the market is following now. If in yeah. fact uh, buyers today, you talk to any of the uh, the big uh, carbon credit buyers today, I, I, I tend to use the analogy uh, of the box, right? So mm -hmm. once upon a time, you would buy a carbon credit, you buy from an intermediary or directly from the project developer in a sealed box, yeah. and then you have to believe the seller what's inside the box. No, the box is sealed; you can't open. Okay, I believe you, and we move forward. Now what happened with this year's post garden and all the events we've seen uh, in the market, right? Buyers want to open the box and see what's inside yeah. for themselves. And that's what I call digital MRV, right? Or I would say even like the, the concept of digital twins. It's a complete digitalization of, of the project. And not only MRV, when you talk about MRV, you're talking about measuring the carbon emission reductions, yep. uh, whether the, the baselines and all of that. We're talking about all activities of the project. So if the project's claiming a contribution to an SDG, show me evidence on a digital form that can be verifiable. Mm -hmm. And not just like on a report that's coming like two years later. That's the, that's uh, the thing, from the, the latency of that time frame. That, yeah, that's so, okay. right. That's the direction in which the market's following now. Okay. And we are establishing a number of partnerships uh, mm -hmm. to, to actually integrate our platform to be able to surface that uh, to, to, to market participants in general. Okay, and do those market participants include the standards as well? Is there a correlation there? Because I mean, you're extracting data from their databases essentially, but is it a two-way street where you could also provide them inputs and, and information around around their database? Because it's actually like raw data now it's processed data effectively. Right? It can be, and eventually this this will become a public utility eventually, yeah. right? At a certain level. A certain of level. course, the yeah. platforms that are emerging in the market uh, to perform this digitalization, they have to monetize that of course. somehow. Yeah. But eventually, this will become at the level, think about even digitizing a, a whole methodology, mm -hmm. right? At yeah. the data point level, even if you still don't have instrumentation to measure those inputs into the methodology, but at least you have the record of that on a digitized form. Yeah. I think that's probably the very first version of, of what's coming up. Yeah, right? but that's great because it leads to scale, right? Because then that's replicable as opposed to this very kind of manual, creative writing exercise that, that a lot of the, the PDDs are subject to effectively. So Absolutely. Th this is kind of an interesting transition. Okay, so quick question here in terms of, you know, like you said, it's this public good. I think in, if I look at the, the broader ecosystem, there's also other, other let's call them agencies for, for lack of a better word, right? I'm thinking the, the rating agencies in this case, the Silvera, B0, Calixes of the world that are providing another public good, which is effectively rating projects as well, right? There seems to be a lot of complementarity with, with the work that you're doing, with the pricing and the quality components. How, how interoperable, how complementary are those uh, those companies to, to what yeah, Grias is doing? Absolutely. They're, they're, in fact, uh, we have partnerships with both B0 and Silvera. Yeah, right. Uh, the headline rating is shown on our platform mm -hmm. at the project level. Right. And vice versa, some of our prices are shown on their respective platforms. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, we are complementary from the perspective that we publish the data as it is. Yeah. And there has to be someone on top of it to make sense of the data and to express opinions, wh whether this is good or bad. Yeah. That's where the rating agencies come into play. Okay. Right. They have that opinion element, right? They, yeah. they dig into, into the data, into the as aspects of each individual project mm -hmm. and express that opinion. We are not in the business of expressing opinion. We're in the business of publishing data, prices, and make it available to enable the market to function. Fantastic. Right? And there will be other players around, you know, coming on top of this data. Okay, so now we've got layer upon layer upon layer effectively of, of refining that data to then glean information to enable better decision making, correct? Absolutely. So if you're a corporate effectively now, like you said, they want to open up the box, see what's inside, they're effectively leveraging your data set and then the opinions of the rating agencies on top in order to determine the better decisions that they should be making around constructing their portfolios. Absolutely. I, I see this no different than, for example, credit markets, which is a mm -hmm. very established market. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and you see rating agencies, you see service providers providing finances on the financial statements. Yeah. 
and uh, all the financials of companies that analysts can in turn can, uh, can, 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 can make sense out of it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And there are tons of different services out there for that. Yeah. So that's where this evolving as well. I, right? I agree. I think that's a really good corollary. I think that carbon as an industry, we've tended to, to um, compare it to commodities, right? Where we, we try to go to standardization, commoditization essentially, but the differentiation that exists therein lends itself really closely to the credit markets, like you said. And I think that what we're experiencing right now is this evol evolution essentially to, to mirror a lot of those same lessons that existed in, in the credit markets and exist today. So looking at the current market landscape today, what do you see happening in order to get us to eventually that, that level of scale that we do see in credit markets? Because that's, that's what carbon markets really need in order to deploy capital is scale. So. Absolutely. I, I believe two things will run in parallel. One is that, le uh, that level of transparency mm -hmm. through the data fabric coming to surface mm -hmm. and people really being able to now make sense out of it, mm -hmm. right? Because the data is there, yep. where today it's not. And the second part is, is the financial institutions being more uh, active in the market. Okay. So we actually uh, work very closely with the banks uh, and a few asset managers in exactly, in exactly doing that. Uh, in, in providing them with the data transparency for, for the market to market for all the activities mm -hmm. because eventually the financial institutions are going to be the market makers and are going to be the ones that drive the market just like they drive credit markets, equity markets and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So when, when that starts to happen, that's when you see liquidity really increasing and, uh, and, uh, and expanding this market. Great. Marcelo, thank you so much. That was really fantastic. I learned so much. Appreciate the time. Pleasure. Thank you, sir. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, thank you.